Now, chapter 6, another controversial chapter in the book of Genesis, where you have the sons of God mixing with the daughters of men. In Genesis 6, 1, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. So at this time, there's no telling how many people were actually alive on the planet. And it wouldn't be far-fetched to say that there were even more during this time in Genesis 6 than there are today because people are having a lot more kids and they're living up to be in their 900s. The parents are living up to be in their 900s. The, their kids are living up to be in their 900s. You no, know, people's not dying, but people's still making children as well. So you're going to have a lot of people in a short time. And it says in Genesis 6, 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. So it was them seeing it that pushed this sin to happen. You know, they saw it, they wanted it, and they took it. And they took them wives of all which they chose. So now, how do we find out who the sons of God are? Well, search the phrase. Job 38 shows us that they were here when God laid the foundations of the earth. So these couldn't be humans of any sort because that was before Adam. In Job 38, 6 through 7, it says, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? And you can't make the cornerstone right there refer to Jesus, even though Jesus is the chief cornerstone, because the context is God laying the foundations of the earth. If you make that Jesus right there, it's going to look like you're saying that God created Jesus. It says, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So the sons of God shouted for joy when God laid the foundations of the earth. That was before Adam and Eve. So the sons of God have to be angels or some other type of heavenly creature that left their first estate and came down to fornicate with human women. So the sons of God, obviously, me and you are sons of God. We believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and became a son of God. But in the Old Testament... It's referring to angels. And it refers to Adam as a son of God in Luke 3.38. Because Adam did not have a earthly father. He was a direct creation from God. So the sons of God angels came down mixed with human women. This explains why their offspring were mighty giant men. And people have a really hard time with this because it's so weird. But at the same time, Genesis is a pretty weird book. I mean, you got a lot of things going on that just don't happen today. I mean, they had a cherubim guarding the tree of life, so they would have seen that. You know, they were no stranger to seeing heavenly beings coming down onto the earth. I doubt there were any atheists. And... People were living to be 900 and something years old. It was just strange times. you got to understand that. It's not like it is today. But this explains why their offspring were mighty giant men. And in Genesis 6, 3 through 4, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When? When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. I mean, that's there was giants because the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So notice there were giants in the earth in those days when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and also after that, showing you it happened again. Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the Wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the Lord flat out tells you what he thinks about the conduct of man. 
It wouldn't be any different if he gave you his opinion about America today. This world we're living in is an awful, awful place. The heart of man is an awful, awful place. And if their heart was a place that you could travel to and visit, you'd probably never make it back home. It's that wicked. In Genesis 6, 6, it says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Imagine how God feels about what he sees today when he looks down and sees the murder and the deceit and the robbery, the lying, the, the sex trafficking. No doubt about it, it grieves him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me, repenteth me that I have made them. The only solution was to wipe out wipe them all out because they're so far out into sin that they would only corrupt anyone and anything else that they touched and unfortunately everyone on the planet other than eight people is going to have to be wiped out and they're just going to have to start over but one of those eight people was Noah it says in Genesis 6 8 but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord these are the generations of Noah Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. He was perfect in his generations. He had good genes that hadn't been corrupted by those ungodly mixed marriages between the sons of God and daughters of men. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. There's three more of those eight people. And the eight people that's going to start the whole thing over is Noah, his three sons, and then all four of those men's wives. They're going to start the whole thing over. Because the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence, through them and behold I will destroy them with the earth make thee an ark of gopher wood room shalt thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch and it talks about in Genesis 6 22 thus did Noah according to all that God had commanded him so did he so imagine being Noah preaching for 120 years that God's going to bring this flood on the earth and it's not even rained before who even knows if Noah's family really even believed him? They would have looked at him as the town drunk, the town crazy person. They would have thought he was that crazy preacher that lived up on the hill or something. <clears throat> but he turns out to be right. In Genesis 7, you see Noah get into the ark and the waters are going to cover the earth. Noah has to get the animals in the ark to keep them from going extinct. And imagine being a spectator of this. And people had to have seen these animals willingly coming to the ark. In Genesis 7, 2 and 3 it says, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So most people just know that he took some animals two by two, but he also takes some by sevens. A fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. And going down a few verses, at verse 16 in ch chapter 7, it says, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And you see, if you don't get male and female, then they can't reproduce. They can't make more of them, and they'll go extinct. I mean, imagine if Noah said, oh, I'm just going to take the boy dogs and didn't bring any girl dogs. They would have went extinct. What if he just took all the girl cats, didn't take any boy cats? They'd all went extinct, right? If you don't get male and female, then they can't reproduce. Once again, the male-on-male -male stuff and the female-on-female -female stuff uh, doesn't make any sense. It can't keep the human race alive. It can't keep anything alive. So that shows you that's not part of God's plan. You know, you don't, 
you, your parts don't go together. It we talked about how it's not convenient. It's like you see the Lord made it convenient, man and a woman getting together. That's convenient, male on male. That's not convenient. But the Lord shuts no in, and if God shuts you in, then you're not getting out, and nobody can get in. And in Genesis seven seventeen, it says, And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. You'll notice that number 40, the flood was forty days upon the earth. That number 40 appears a lot in your Bible. 40 is the number of testing, and Jonah cried to Nineveh, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jesus Christ fasted 40 days and 40 nights when he was tempted of the devil. Goliath presented himself 40 days and 40 nights. Moses and Elijah both fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So you notice that number 40 continuously appearing over and over again. And if you've got a certain uh, besetting sin or something like that, I think a good thing to do would be to try your hardest to get rid of that sin, get away from somebody or something that's trying to cause you to do that sin and try to get away from it for 40 days and do some extreme extra Bible reading and praying in that 40 days and Look how you turn out at the end of that 40 days. But the ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. He protected Noah and his family from the wrath of God. The ark did. Uh, the water was from the wrath of God and the ark took the wrath. The water never touched Noah. The wrath never touched Noah and his family. Just like Jesus Christ took our wrath when he was on the cross... And when he was on the cross, he was lifted up above the earth, just like the ark. It says, and, and the flood was 40 days up on the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and lit, it was lift up above the earth. Jesus was lift up above the earth when he was on the cross, and he took our wrath, just like the ark took the wrath for Noah. And the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went up on the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. So all those high places, those high hills, the tops of the mountains, and places where they most likely were doing wicked things and sacrificing to their abominable gods were wiped out in the flood. Genesis 8. The flood subsides. Noah sends forth the raven out of the ark. He's going to see, you know... Is it time for me to get out of this ark yet? So he sends out a raven. And that raven is going to picture the devil or unclean spirits because it goes to and fro. And then he sends out a dove that's going to picture the Holy Spirit. And then you get in Genesis chapter 9, Noah is, get, is off the ark. And you're going to see the Noahic covenant. Now the Noahic covenant in Genesis 9, 1 through 17... In this covenant, Noah is told to, number one, be fruitful and multiply. Number two, he's told that the fear of man would be on all the animals. Number three, he's told that man can now be meat eaters. But number four, you can't eat blood. He's, he sees that God is insti instituting capital punishment. Uh, number six, there will be no more a flood to destroy the earth. And the rainbow is the token of the covenant. And Shem, him, and Japheth are to spread out and populate the earth. It says in Genesis nine eighteen through 21, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So you see, these people got off the ark. They had the whole world before them. They were the, light, the only people on earth. They were starting over. And these are the three sons of Noah. And of them, the whole earth is overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman. And he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. So Noah ends up getting drunk. It looks unintentional. 
but we don't know for sure, but it leads him to being violated by his own son, Ham. And a curse is put on Canaan, the son of Ham. A curse is put on Canaan and his line because of this sin. And in Genesis chapter 10, you have the descendants of Noah and his sons, and you're going to see that Sodomites come from the line of Ham, the one who seemingly just violated his own father. So this is all making a lot of sense. The Sodomites are the homosexuals, the ones that are going to get destroyed in Genesis chapter 19. But it says in uh, Genesis 10, 19 through 20, it's showing you the line of Ham and Sodom comes from them. And then you got Shem in Genesis 10, 22 through 24. It says the children of Shem, Elam and Asher and Arphaxad and Lud and Aram and the children of Aram, Uz and Hul and Gether and Mash and Arphaxad beget Selah and Selah beget Eber. Now that Eber, that's, his name is significant. We know the Jews come from Shem and this is why when someone doesn't like the Jews they say that person is anti-Semitic. Like anti-Semitic. And this guy Eber comes from Shem. And the name Eber is where you get the name Hebrew. And you're about to be introduced to the character named Abram, the Hebrew. So that's significant. In Genesis chapter 11, you've got the Tower of Babel. And in this story, you have a picture of the future one world government. In Genesis 11, 1, it says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. You see, everybody's gotten together. And when the Antichrist gets here and sets up his little false kingdom, everybody's going to get together. A one world religion. One world monetary system. One everything. All this togetherness stuff. Just like when... COVID was going on real bad. You, you heard people talking about, we're in this together. And when they'd want you to separate, they'd say, alone together. All this crazy, stupid sounding stuff. And Genesis eleven four, and they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. So they have big goals they're trying to reach new heights, but they're trying to reach these new heights without God being in the picture. You see, they were supposed to scatter abroad upon the face of the earth, like he told Shem, him, and Japheth to do, but they didn't. And the more man gets together, the more they get in a mess. And in Genesis eleven six, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You see, man can do crazy things when they put their minds together. They can invent things that lead to their own downfall or that can open a door that they really would wish they did not open. And that's most likely what they were doing at this Tower of Babel. They were trying to make contact again with those sons of God. And it says, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. This is the Lord talking now. He's going to come down. The Lord himself is coming down, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them or brought up from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. See, it's nothing for the Lord to come down and mess up their plans. And the Lord is going to come down and mess up man's plans again in the next one world government. He messed up Nimrod and Babel. Next, he will mess up the Antichrist in his kingdom. And he will come down then as well at the second coming. That's what this pictures. And finally, we're going to run into the man named Abram. And the rest of Genesis will be about Abram and his seed. The rest of the Old Testament will pretty much be about the people who come from Abraham, the Jews. So Abram, who will be called Abram, Abraham soon, comes from the line of Shem and Eber. 
It says in Genesis 11:29, And Abram took Nahor, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. You see, Sarai doesn't have a child yet, but from her and Abram will be the people whom God makes a covenant with. And the rest of this book of Genesis is going to be about Abraham and the sons that come from Abraham. It's going to go Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name will be changed to Israel. And Jacob is going to have 12 sons, which make up the 12 tribes. And from them come the children of Israel. You see, they're called Israel because Jacob's name is changed to Israel. They're called Hebrews because their ancestor was Eber. And eventually they'll be called Jews because of Judah. They don't get called Jews until later on. You'll see it in the, the books of the kings. They're called Jews because of uh, the kingdom of Judah. Genesis chapter 12, God's promise to Abraham. Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So Abram and Sarai are going to have a miracle birth. A boy will be born to them in their old age. And from them will come the nation of Israel. Abram is the first Jew. It says in Genesis 12, 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So the nations that are good to Israel will be blessed, and the ones who aren't will be cursed. Abram is a great man, but he's still a man. And he may be uh, got a special covenant with God here but he's still a man and what you're going to see next is Abram lies about his wife and says that Sarai is his sister and he does this because he's afraid that the men of Egypt are going to kill him for his wife it wouldn't hurt for Abram to be a little bit more jealous over his wife you know a lot of people think jealousy is a bad thing when it comes to their spouse but you shouldn't want a bunch of men flirting and trying to go out on a date with your wife. That doesn't make any sense. It should make you ready to fight. And Abraham wasn't a wimp. He, he should have been ready to take on all the Egyptians over his wife, Sarah. But if you've read Genesis, then you know that Abraham did something else that he really wasn't supposed to do as well. That is, he took Lot, his nephew Lot, with him. When he left back there in Genesis 11. Um, he took a lot with him. and But they end up having to separate. In Genesis 13, Abram and Lot separate, and Lot goes to Sodom. It explains this in Genesis 13, 10 through 12. Lot t pitched his tent toward Sodom, and he put his tent in the wrong place. And you can go somewhere and be a light to the people. You just don't want to pitch your tent there. And you may even live in a wicked place like Las Vegas or San Francisco, but you don't have to pitch your tent there and get involved in what they're doing. You see, Lot got a little too involved. So much involved that his sons-in-law think he's a joke when he tries to warn them to get out of Sodom when God's about to rain down fire and brimstone. But it describes them... It describes the men of Sodom in Genesis 13, 13. It says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And throughout the Bible, you see God getting angry over Sodomites. In Genesis 19, you'll see him rain fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah because they're so wicked. And in Leviticus 18, 22 it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is 
abomination. You know, it was never okay, it was never God's plan for a man to lie with another man and for a woman to lie with another woman. He says in Leviticus 20 and verse 13, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So you see, it's just not just some okay thing. It's a very wicked, serious thing. And you say, well, that's just Old Testament. But what about Romans chapter 1, 26 through 27, where it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. So it calls it a vile affection. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Homosexuality is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman. A man wanting to be with a woman is a natural thing. A man wanting to be with another man is an unnatural thing. It's a vile affection. So, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. So to pretend that God isn't against homosexuality, with these clear verses... In the Bible, you're just simply denying the Bible and you're believing in a God that isn't the God of the Bible. But can a homosexual get saved? Definitely. Jesus died for that sin just as much as he died for any other sin. Is it possible for a Christian to commit the sin of homosexuality? Well, he can commit adultery. He can commit murder. And most likely a person who struggled with homosexuality before they were saved will feel that same sin in their sinful flesh after they are saved. Just like a drunk might still desire alcohol after he's saved. Just like a pill head might desire pills after they're saved. A sodomite might still have wicked homosexual thoughts after salvation and if he lets that overcome him he'll end up committing the same sins he did before he was saved and none of what i just said is popular because you'll have homosexuals who might hear this and be mad for me saying it's a sin to be a homosexual and you'll have christians who are mad for me saying that homosexuals can be saved or mad because i said that it's possible for a christian to commit that sin your flesh is capable of committing any sin that there is. Because when you got saved, your flesh didn't get born again. I don't believe all sins are the same. Some sins are worse than others. But your flesh is still vile and wicked. Extremely wicked. Your flesh did not just get made a little bit better. After you got saved, it's still as vile and wicked as it was before you were saved. You have to keep it under control. You have to bring it into subjection. So, it is very possible for you to commit that sin. Especially if that's a sin you struggled with before you were saved. And compare that with any sin. You know, if you struggle with alcohol, it's probably going to be hard for you to turn down alcohol at times. If you struggled with cussing, that may be a problem for you. But the Lord speaks to Abram again after he separates from Lot. And there may be something to that. He speaks to Abram again after he separates from Lot. It says in Genesis thirteen fourteen through 16, And the Lord said unto Abram, After that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward, for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall they, thy seed also be numbered. And God reminds Abraham of his promise to him. Sometimes when you're with someone that you're not supposed to be with, they can cause you to forget the promises. They can cause you to be more earthly minded instead of heavenly minded. So the Lord reminds Abraham, of his promise again. So Lot separated from Abram. 
But Lot is still proving to be more trouble than he's worth. And in Genesis 14, Abram has to rescue Lot. In Genesis 14, 14 through 15, it says, And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, talking about Lot, which is his nephew, but it's calling him his brother here, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided to himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So Abram is a lot tougher than most people realize. He has trained servants that fight when he needs them. And with these 318, he will go and rescue Lot and defeat five armies. That sounds like something from a movie. 318 men going against five armies. And after this, Abraham is visited by a mysterious character named Melchizedek. And he's also visited by someone else, the king of Sodom. And in Genesis 14, 18, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek is a picture of the Lord Jesus. Notice he brings forth bread and wine, just like the Lord. Notice he is a priest, just like the Lord. And it says, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And this is Melchizedek passing down the crown of the kingdom of heaven down to Abraham. And it says, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. It wasn't that Abram and his 318 trained servants were so well trained and tough and mean. It is that the Lord himself delivered Abram's enemies into his hand. Now, Abram meets another king, but this one is a wicked king. And in Genesis 14, 21, it says, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. See, you see, he wants the people that Abram rescued. He's wanting the persons. He doesn't need the, the stuff. You see, Sodomites want people because Sodomites can't reproduce. They can only recruit. They're interested in your children. Why do you think they want to have drag queen story hour? Why does your kid need a man to dress up like a hooker and read to him? That's sick. Why would Why would your kid need that? Why do you think... As a parent, when I see other parents taking their children to a drag queen story hour, that just disturbs me. I don't even know how to describe it. That's some sick stuff. Why is it that they are taking these kids to these drag shows that are like halfway gay strip clubs or something? The way these drag queens are dressing and moving around it's a, they're uh, grooming these children, trying to turn them into sexual perverts just like they are. Because they can't reproduce, they have to recruit. They have to get more people to become like them. And they think they deserve all kinds of sympathy and more and more tolerance, even though they're very intolerant of people like me. But what they have to do is they have to mold your mind so that you'll become a sex pervert. And if they can start doing that at a young age, you'll be more likely to accept them when you get their age. So that's what's with this agenda of always uh, pushing this junk on the children in the movies and in everyday life. Bring, uh, they're bringing these drag queens to churches now and have a man coming in there with makeup and a wig and dressed up like a hooker how what is what is that that's ungodly that's very sinful and that shows what type of condition this world's in when people think that this is fun and cute and innocent that's some sick stuff most likely if that man was alone with your child and could do anything there's no telling what he would do 
You know, where is your mind when you uh, are okay with things like this? And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand with, unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from thee a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Abram doesn't want to take anything from the king of Sodom. He doesn't need anything the wicked world can give him. He doesn't want this wicked world saying, I have made Abram rich. Now, Genesis 15, God appears to Abram in a vision and tells him he's going to have a child of his own bowels that will be his heir. Genesis 15, when after these things, the, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Back before there was a written word of God, the Lord appeared to men in dreams and visions. So the Lord appears to Abraham in a vision and Abram always turned, turn, uh, tuned in to anything the Lord had to say. And this time he tells Abraham that he's his shield. And if the Lord is your shield, then you don't have to have any arrows, swords, spears, or debris hitting you. You won't have to worry about any of that hitting you. You got your shield, the Lord. And Abram can really count on being alive until he has at least had his first child by Sarai, he done told him. He, he's, he's promised that him and Sarai are going to have a child together. So he, he shouldn't even have to worry about dying until that happens. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, meaning count the stars, if thou be able to number them. He said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So he's telling Abraham, you know, look up at the sky look up at the stars can you count all those stars obviously abraham can't and he's like that's how many children you're gonna have so many that you can't number and abraham believed in the lord and he counted to him for righteousness abram got imputed righteousness because he believed god about his seed and when you start doubting god's promises go out at night look up and if god can make all that and keep it from falling on you then he can easily get you to heaven. He can easily keep you eternally secure. And in this chapter, you see God's covenant with Abraham. Genesis fifteen eighteen. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And this is one of the reasons that the devil hates the Jews, because they get the land that used to be his, and the promised seed comes from Abraham as well and the seed that was promised to bruise his head comes from Abraham Genesis 3 15 that promised seed comes from Abraham you see Abram believes the Lord about his seed but the problem is that Abram is impatient God isn't in a hurry but for some reason Abram is and you'll see in Genesis 16 that Abram and Sarai fail in waiting on the Lord.